Today's guest, a former two-time champion of the world, Steve Molitor, Joe Tilly's great Canadian sports show. Coming up! Our guest today hails from Sarnia, Ontario. He is a flight analyst at DAZN and other networks. He is a five-time Canadian amateur champion, the Canadian super bantamweight champ as a pro, the Commonwealth bantamweight champion, the former NABA bantamweight champion, and a two-time IBF super bantamweight champion of the world, the Canadian kid, Steve Molitor. Steve. Great to have you on the show, man. Looking good, buddy. What's up? What's up, Joe? Thanks for having me, buddy. You're, you're a great hype, man. I should bring you out with me more often. I'd like to begin at the beginning here on the show, Steve. And, and I know you started boxing when you're nine years old. That's pretty young. Uh, what made you decide that you wanted to be a fighter? Um, I just had an older brother at the time who was who was into it for a year. He became a Canadian champion pretty, pretty quickly. So I just wanted to follow in his footsteps. You know, I was a little small for hockey. so. I wanted to, I always knew that I wanted that, that one-on-one competition. I didn't want to, have to rely on like a teammate or somebody else to, uh, to get us the victory. Well, that's right. When you're in the ring, it's just you and your opponent and you don't rely on anybody else and you don't have any excuses and you, <laughs> and you, and you got nobody else to blame it on if things don't, don't go right. Right. It can be good and it can be bad. It's a double-edged sword, but yeah, I did like that, that sort of, of a sporting event where you I mean it's all relied on you whether you win or lose it's on you well what would you say is uh you know five canadian titles as an amateur what what led to your success um just hard work and discipline and and the most important thing was to have somebody good like silvio fax with my amateur coach for 10 years who really gave me the pedigree and the basic foundation i needed and the work ethic and the discipline along with um, him and the other stable mates I had in Sarnia, just giving me that sort of confidence and knowledge to, to get to that level. When did you decide it was time to turn pro? Um, it was in 1999. I, I lost the Nationals to go to the Olympics, and I really wasn't happy with the scoring system. It was the tight defense, sneaking a point, like pussy, pussy boxing at the time, I called it. I mean, he said, just sneak in a punch, and a guy could just sneak in a punch like that, and it would count. So I didn't really like it at then. So I just packed up a hockey bag full of clothes, and I moved to a gym. I lived in Adrian Tedorescu's gym for almost three years, just and started my pro career out. Yeah, let's talk about that. Living in Adrian Tedorescu's gym, I mean, there were some lean years in the beginning. Let's, let's face it. Uh, it. It's not as glamorous as, as some people seem to think, is it? You know, people think that you mean, oh, Stevie's a pro boxer now. Like, where's his Mercedes or where's his Escalade? Like, listen, there's no money in boxing, especially if you're going in there with no Olympic medal and you have no, you mean, you have no sort of backing. Like, you just start at the very, 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 very bottom, which I did. Like, you know, Joe, I lived, I lived in the Adrian's gym for almost three years. I worked at the bus boy at Casey. They worked at the mall part time to I mean, to help feed myself and survive. And I started at the bottom. I was traveling. Joe, you knew earlier on in my career. I went to Scotty Olson's hometown. I went to Nikki Boo's hometown. I did a lot of travel on the road. I wasn't like I said. I didn't have a massive amateur pedigree, Olympic gold medal, or Commonwealth gold medal. I had nothing. So I just started from the bottom and worked my way all the way to the top. Yeah, in that particular time, uh, when you're coming up that that time, there wasn't a real uh, big pro boxing scene in, in in Toronto or Ontario, for that matter. Uh, it was, uh, you know, there were some tough times. It was tough, hard to put on shows because of the way the commission operated and everything else. So, uh, yeah, so th- there there were some tough times. You had to do a lot of traveling. You mentioned, and you know, one of the one of the turning points in your career it seems to me certainly was in February two thousand and two. Uh, when you had to travel into uh, Scotty, the Bulldogs' uh, hometown of Edmonton, and, and face the guy who was, you know, a veteran guy, a former Olympian, uh, and he'd fought for the world title. But this was a really one-sided fight. Surprised a lot of people. 
as you stepped up here and and, uh, and ended up uh, stopping the bulldog, dropping him. And I don't know if he'd ever even been down before in his career. If he had, it hadn't been off, and that's for sure. And uh, and there we go. So what? Uh, tell us about this fight. And you can see him reaching for the ropes there. He was uh, he was pretty badly hurt. Surprised a lot of people because they didn't really know you had that kind of punching power, did they? No, they didn't. They thought I was a young amateur. You know, I mean, kid like that. And Scotty was a legend of the game. He's been a legend of Canada for many, many years. And he's one of the greatest humans that met in the sport of boxing to this day. Um, Scotty Olson is one of the nicest men I've met in this sport to this day. Um, I mean, I was an up-and-coming young, hungry kid. I was living at the gym at that time, training every day, two, three times a day, just to be a savage, to get myself out of the position I was in. Unfortunately for Scotty, I mean, he wasn't as active as he was in the prime of his career. He was at the tail end of his career, but regardless, he was still 11 and 0 in Edmonton at, at that time. Me going in there, he had an opponent pull out two and a half weeks prior to the fight that he's supposed to fight for Mexico. So Adrian at the time, you know, I mean, really believed in me and knew that I'd been training nonstop while I was living at the gym. So we took the fight on two and a half weeks' notice, and then we I mean, made our statement that I mean in Canada that I was the best in that weight division at that time. So this was a, this was a turning point for your career because it opened up a lot of eyes, you know, like a, a lot of people knew you as a very slick amateur who was, uh, you know, had a lot of success in the amateur ranks. But uh, to, to me, this is when you really stepped up as a pro and, and, and showed people what you what you got. But it was also uh, about that time that you received some devastating news. Uh, you know, we you know, we've all undergone our own difficult circumstances, but uh you know, like losing our son Spencer was was crushing for our family. But you you guys uh, had a, a devastating situation with your brother Jeremy when he's charged and convicted with murder. How did that affect you? And how did that you know how did you get through that? Um, obviously, I mean, it obviously devastated me, the city I grew up in, um, the the family of the girl, my family, and for me at the time I was living in Toronto which is obviously three hours away from Sarnia. So I just really just stuck my nose into training like a, like an animal and just focusing all my energy onto boxing and what I wanted to become. All the negative, all the positive, everything that came about from that situation, I just tried to, to use it as fuel to just, you know, I mean, focus on my craft, work hard, stay disciplined, and I mean, achieve the goal that I want to achieve. You know, like like uh, many of us, when when we're faced with those uh, tough times in, in our lives, we we uh, we've turned to alcohol, drugs, and and that was uh, the same situation for you. But you were able to get through that in in your career. How how were you able to do that? Um, well, I wasn't. Get, well, I wouldn't say I was able to get through it, Joe. Being honest, looking back, and I've been honest about it before, I was able to navigate it in a in a in a way that. It didn't hinder my career too, too much. Um, after I won the world title and I got, I mean, Casino Ram opened up for me. I mean, I knew I was going to fight here. I was going to fight here. I was going to have a break here. So, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, drugs, cocaine, and Oxycontin were a major part of my life in between fights. If I had a two or three week break, I mean, I was doing that sort of shit every single day up until January 5th, 2009, the day my son was born. After I had my first loss to Celestino Caballero, um, a couple months later, my son was born, and that's when I just said, you know what, I'm done with all this shit, all the drugs, all the booze, and all that stuff, and I quit everything cold turkey. I've been clean and sober for 14 years now, and um, I mean, I couldn't feel better with myself, and that was one of my biggest victories was was being sober and being off drugs. That was my the biggest victory for me personally was being clean off that stuff before my son came to this earth. Well, that's pretty awesome, Steve. Uh, you know, as somebody who's been clean and sober for many years myself, uh, yeah, I, I understand what the, what that's all about. But I, I, I find it hard to believe that Steele's 14 years old already. Holy God. Yeah, <laughs> he's a man. I, I was going 14, Joe, you didn't even want to know what I was going 14. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome. But I want to talk about, um, you know, resume your career here. You know, you continued to rack up some big wins. You know, you talk, talked about uh, traveling in other people's backyard a lot. We 2002 in September, you traveled across the pond to face Nicky Booth in his hometown of Brentwood, England. 
uh, won that decision, claiming the Commonwealth title. Uh, not easy to win in Boost Backyard, I would suspect. Uh, he had four fights that year, pretty pretty busy times. Uh, tell us about you know traveling into uh, Brentwood. Um, that was a, that was another kind of short notice. I think we had three and a half weeks for that Nicky Boot fight. Then opponent pull out, and Adrian again, he was just confident in me. And after what had happened with my brother, and he's seen the the shift in my mentality. And not that I didn't work out hard before, because I've always been a hard worker, but that just that whole ordeal just shifted me mentally, physically in a direction that was only going to make me succeed in boxing. because That was my whole entire life. Every breath I took, every thought I had was only about boxing at that point. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to deal with the reality of my life at that point. So I just focused on boxing, just trained hard and just wanted to just get done what I, I've dreamed about since I was nine years old. Right. And uh, taking care of the business in front of you as it's, as it comes along, right. In September, uh, or sorry, in 2004, this is April actually, uh, against Hugh D'Anzo at the Shaw Festival, a tough experienced fighter from Mexico, a uh, 12 rounder here for the NABA bantamweight title. First time you got a chance to go that championship distance. Uh, what did you mm -hmm. learn from those 12, 12 rounds? Um, just to be patient, and you mean it was, it was a whole new experience going 12 rounds. And like you mentioned, Joe, Hugo D'Anzo at that point, he had fought a lot of good fighters. I mean, he was kind of the gatekeeper um, for a guy like me to get to that next level of being in the top 10, top 15 in the world. So that was a big night for me <clears throat> um, and a big victory for me to, to beat Hugo D'Anzo at that point of his career and that point of my career. You know, at that point, and you, you talked about, uh, you know, turning points in your career and, and uh, you know, that was a time when it was, uh, it wasn't long after that when you decided to uh, to leave Adrian Tudorescu and, and uh, sign with Alan Tremblay and, of course, hooking up with Chris Johnson. Tell us about how that came about. I mean, I mean, me and Adrian, unfortunately, may he rest in peace. Adrian, was a, before he got into what happened, Adrian was a major, major, major part of my success. I went into that boy at Atlas Boxing at 19 years old. I went in there as a boy, and in 2002, I left there as a man. Adrian did a lot for me in my career. I'm very grateful for him and Gina for everything they did for me, how they housed me, they took care of me. They, they did a lot for me. Um, but unfortunately, me and Adrian had some um, disagreements and some business issues outside of um, our relationship as friends. And I decided to go my own separate way with James Jardine and Alan Trombley of Orion Sports Management, James Jardine of U.S. Traffic. And I wanted to get a new trainer. Chris had just moved back from Atlanta. I had always admired Chris and looked up to him, and we connected to Mississauga. And then, you know, what, what happened from there? Yeah, yeah. You think uh, tend to go, tend to go pretty good. Because Chris had never, he hadn't done a lot of training at that point. Of course, he was an amazing fighter. Uh, but, uh, you know, you guys seemed to, to click, uh, you know, it worked out. Yeah, he didn't have any fighters at that point. Like, I was one of his, um, like, I mean, he was training guys at the local gym and training some amateur fighters, but nothing on the level that we got to. Or I don't even know if he was training any pros at the time, but I'd always looked up to Chris. I knew he was a great boxer. He'd been to a few of my fights. He was at Agent Gym a few times. I've always admired Chris and his work ethic. And, you know what I mean? He had, I knew he had been in the States a lot in Atlanta. In Detroit with James Tony, I mean, he's in, with, in Florida with Roy Jones. He had that experience and that knowledge and that youthfulness. And and something that happened that I didn't even know happened. But, I mean, after my brother went away in 2002, Chris kind of, like, filled that role for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. like, he kind of, aside from being a great trainer and, you I mean, coaching me and being this, like, he was kind of, filled those shoes as my older brother like you know, I mean stevie don't do that you should maybe do that or don't say that maybe you should say that i mean he was just always there for me and had my back and you know i was uh, very grateful for that he was a guy who was pretty calm and cool and collected too wasn't he like a uh, very stabilized <laughs> influence in the class I, I don't know i don't know about calm cool and collected <laughs> um chris is, uh, not. chris is a character in his own but he's a great man he's a great trainer for me we had um, a great six, seven years together where we, or not even six, we had like great five or six years where, you I mean, we, 
we did what we wanted to do. We, we accomplished my dream and our goals. We had a great time doing it. Me and Chris had a lot of fun. We did a lot of great things together. And I mean, it's, it's history in the making or history in the books. Right. I oh, hate said at one point, he said, uh, yeah, you weren't necessarily the great best skill wise, but your will to win was off the charts. So uh, how do you think about, how do you feel about that assessment? hundred percent. Even growing up as an amateur, I was no standout. I mean, there wasn't no promoters knocking down my doors or, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't an, a standout. Um, but my mentality to just outwork every and anybody ever always every time no one ever worked me no one ever ran me no one ever did anything more than me i just outworked everyone and i knew that and i i didn't know for sure but i was just hoping that all this hard work would pay off and i just never let anyone ever 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 outwork me well you know that work ethic was was huge for you obviously and being prepared at all times was was great and then of course the, you got the opportunity the big one and once again, you're the road warrior. Uh, and here's a tough test. November 10th, 2006, you're off to Hartlepool, England to face Michael Hunter. Both of you guys were undefeated. Raucous crowd. Of course, they expected their man to win here. But you would knock him out in the fifth round. Tell me about this fight and what it was like to go to Hartlepool, England to face Michael Hunter. Well, Joe, I'm not sure if you know the exact details, but it was about two and a half months prior to that fight in England. I was supposed to fight for the vacant IBF world title versus Gabula Babaza in South Johannesburg, South Africa. I was in there, made the weight. We had the media week, the press week. Two days before the fight, the promoter came to me and said, there's no fight. Babaza had failed his, his, uh, his blood work. He had HIV. Mm. So I did. And I was in good, good shape for that fight. Obviously, it was going to be my first world title fight. So I had to come down from that not happening to this being scheduled in november so i get right back in the gym and my mentality and hunger was just as strong but i knew the crowd in harley pool i've been to england before the way they support and support their fighters is just crazy so i knew mentally i had to be just as much ready as i was physically to deal with that sort of atmosphere and that sort of pressure you can see your reaction there that's pretty awesome i mean uh you, court, you, you claim the vacant IBF uh, Bantamweight Championship of the world, uh, was, or the Super Bantamweight, I guess it was. Uh, what did you feel like? What was it like when they, when, they, when they announced your name as a winner? Raise your hand. Tell us about that moment. What was that like? Um, just relief. You know what I mean? I, um, I'm very hard on myself, and I work very hard, and I, put a lot, I feel like I put a lot of pressure on myself, and I wanted to, to please everyone as well who helped me along the way. My mother, my father, my family, my friends, my supporters, the Adrian Tita Rescues of the world. I mean, the work that Chris had put in, the, the financial support that James Jardine and U.S. Traffic had given me, support from Alan Tremblay, and just all my family and friends. And then, but most importantly, just for myself, I, it's something since I was nine years old that I'd given my life to. I missed a lot of stuff growing up as a kid. I missed parties, school trips. I missed a lot. I missed everything in my life. It was just my whole life was just boxing. So I was for once in my life, I was happy for myself that I did what I wanted to do and I worked hard for it and I got it. Well, certainly a long way from living above the gym at, uh, at, uh, at Atlas boxing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No question about that. So now, uh, you come back home and you finally get a chance to fight at home. You get a chance to defend your title five times all at home with the Rumble at Rambo, which became the Steve Molitor show. And uh, what was it like to have your own series? Um, I loved it. Like, you know, and, and, and hats off to Alan Trombley, um, more so than anybody. He had all the connections with Phil King of TSN. He went to the casino and, and presented this to them. <laughs> he made it all happen. Yes, I was a product, but there's a lot of behind the scenes work that Alan Tremblay did, but it was so, so great to, to finally be at home defending a world title, fighting for a world title in front of my family and friends. I mean, that was the icing on the cake. Winning the world title in Harley Pool was my dream come true. 
But the fight, like you see there in front of all my family and friends, my father ringside, um, I mean, it was the ultimate. This is something that I'll have forever. My kids will be able to see forever. I mean, to me, this is the, I mean, my life's complete. This is, uh, you know, this is your second title offense against Foss on 3K Battery. Uh, a rugged veteran from Thailand who had 70 fights. He had won 13 straight at this point after you know, losing to some guy named Manny Pacquiao. Uh, well, you'd already, your first title fight was a win over Tackling and Dovu with a, a TKO in it. But what do you remember about this fight, your second one, second title offense? Um, this guy was tough as fuck. I ain't going to lie. He was so tough. And I knew at the weigh-ins when I saw his hands, like, this guy's going to be a tough night. He had thick calves like Manny Pacquiao. I knew he was going to hit hard. Um, but I still knew I was going to win. I kind of went in there with a, with a little bit of a careless mentality where I wanted to, after knocking out Michael Hunter and knocking out Logo, I wanted to knock this guy out so, so bad that I looked for it. I haunted for it. I went for it. And, and I didn't fight good. I didn't fight the slick Steve Mulder that everyone I knew or was accustomed to at that point. I tried to sit there and bang him out and knock him out to impress the crowd, to impress my people. It wasn't my greatest performance, Joe, but I still got the W. But hats off to that dude because he was tough as nails. I hit him with everything, and he took it. Were you starting to think that perhaps at this point you were a bit of a KO artist? Was that, did that enter your mind? I'm not a KO artist, but I just, I just love getting the knockout. I love, you know, I mean, that's, I just love the feeling of, of getting the knockout, and not leaving it in the, the judges, the judges' hands. I never thought it was some crazy knockout artist guy. Like, you know, I mean, like, I didn't, I didn't believe I was a, a killer knockout guy. I've always been a guy who will systematically break you down to the head, to the body, break you down mentally, make you miss, make you pay, and just take you out. But in that fight there, I was I was searching for for a one shot KO, which I mean it didn't favor me, and ultimately I didn't fight my best fight there, but still got the W. But the, there would be some more KOs. Uh, it was a unanimous decision over Ricardo Castillo, uh, Fernando Beltran, another unanimous decision at, at Rama. Then your fifth straight title defense was against uh, Cafrino Dario Lombardo. This guy's from Argentina. He was eighteen and zero heading in, but you stopped him. In the tenth round, at that point you're 28. No, tell us about uh, where you're at in this this point in your career. Oh, this was my first fight without Chris Johnson. Um, me and Chris had had a falling out. Well, Chris and Chris and Allen actually had the falling out, and for me to continue to my rumble at Rama, they said Chris couldn't be a part of the of my team, so I moved to Montreal. I started training with Stefan LaRouche, who's a world renowned trainer. I was training with Lucien Booth, who was also an IBF world uh, champion at the time. So, I mean, I was, I was in great company. I was with the greatest trainer, one of the greatest trainers on the planet, and Stefan LaRouche. Um, and, yeah, this was, uh, you know, I mean, this guy was undefeated. He was a former Olympian from Argentina. Um, he wasn't a massive threat to me, but, I mean, we're setting up for the, for the unification versus Caballero. Right. And that was, uh, you know, but this at this point now you've got five five straight fights, title defenses, everything's going well. Uh, but where were you at after that fight uh, in terms of you know emotional, spiritual fitness? Right after this fight, yeah. Um, I was I was kind of just like a little bit lost and confused to be honest, Joe. Um, me and Chris had such a good thing that. No human can understand, no businessman, no promoter, no manager. They don't understand that sort of chemistry that me and Chris had and the confidence that came with the relationship that we had. And if you've seen any of me and Chris's fights, we didn't get, we didn't get touched. No one came close to us. Um, but that confidence was broken and shook when, they, when, I, when I wasn't allowed to keep training with Chris. And I mean, I felt that my my world was kind of starting to, to spiral just a little bit. I mean, they, I, mean I, I wasn't with Chris anymore. My wife was, my, my fiance at the time was pregnant with my first kid. The drugs were getting heavy. I was getting more popular. The drugs were <laughs> a lot more frequent. Um, 
And I felt like my whole life was kind of spiraling a little bit of there, just trying to keep everything under control. I had a, a baby on the way. I had the biggest fight of my life on the way. I was training in another province in Montreal. It kind of felt like it was, it was a bit of a whirlwind for me at that point, to be honest. Yeah, and then the unification bout with uh, Celestino Caballero, the WBA champ who uh, five foot eleven, massive reach advantage, uh, very awkward, very powerful. This fight didn't go out well, obviously. Uh, you suffered defeat for the very first time. Uh, you know, the, the big uppercut did the damage. Uh, tell us uh, what was it like to, to uh, you know, to suffer defeat for the first time. That's the first time I've ever seen me get knocked down. I've never watched that fight in my life until right now on this show. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It was uh, it was devastating, obviously, Joe. You know what I mean? I, I had came so far... And I was on such a high, and I mean, boxing in in Ontario or Canada wasn't even that big at that point. And then for the year and a half whirlwind that we went on with the Rumble at Rama, um, live boxing on TSN, me being on TSN, um, it was just huge. And then for it all to kind of just get crushed in one night, was a, it was a big blow for me mentally and physically at the time, obviously. You know, uh, it's, it, you know, you still go through that defeat and you described it, you know, very well where you're at in terms of, you know, emotionally and, and everything else. But, um, you know, you, you did get back. You, you talked about getting straight now, your son being born. He decided it's time to change, change turn your life around and uh, reunited with Chris, Chris Johnson. Uh, three more fights to get your game back and uh, all wins. Uh, March 27th, 2010, uh, Takalani and Dolvu, number two, uh, back at Rama for the vacant IBF title. And uh, that scrappy South, uh, South African, you would win, beat him for the second time and become the second fighter in history to, uh, to regain the world title along with Lennox Lewis. Uh, so that's, that's some pretty good company. Uh, you know, you and Lennox Lewis are the only two Canadian fighters to lose the title and gain it back. And and uh, you are also one of two fighters in Ontario to win a world championship besides a guy named Tommy Burns who fought back in the turn of the 20th century. Uh, what does it feel like to be in, in that kind of co uh, company? Um, it feels good. You know, I mean, like I said, I, I've, I've given my life to the sport of boxing from a very early age. I've made a lot of sacrifices. And you know, I mean, I'm very grateful to be among that company, and I feel that I worked hard for it, and I deserve it. And you know, I mean, I'm I'm honored to be along in those names with guys like Lennox Lewis and stuff like that. Like those guys are are legends of the sport, so to be even mentioned in the same sentence as them is an honor. So four more fights after that, two losses uh, after when he regaining the title, two two wins. Uh, how did you know it was time to wrap up the career? Um, you mean, I was just in the, in the, in the, in the lighter weight classes, Joe, speed and timing is very important. I mean, anything under 140, 147, speed and timing is so important. Guys like Lennox can fight at the heavyweight division until they're 39, 40, because it's more so about the power and the power is the last thing to go. I just felt that I mean, after such a long career and so many ups and downs, I didn't have the, the speed and the heart and the determination that I used to have. I had a young family. My daughter was just born on top of my son's steel. Um, I had made a lot of money at Casino Rama. And I just, I was just done with it. You know, I, mean, I was just done. I didn't have my heart in, in, in it anymore. I didn't feel like I could compete at the highest level anymore. I could have fought, sure, at these CAA cards and fought a couple more years, but I've always wanted to compete at the highest level and compete with the best. And after I knew I couldn't compete with the best, then it was time for me to hang them up. Any regrets looking back on that career? None whatsoever. I have no regrets whatsoever. I, I did what I wanted to do, and I did it twice. Um, I feel like I left a name for myself in the sport of boxing, at least here in, in Canada, if not worldwide. I did what I wanted to do. I had fun doing it. I made a lot of money. I made a lot of friends. I lost a lot of money. I lost a lot of friends. I mean, it's it's a life experience. 
You know, uh, you become quite an analyst uh, in, in, in your post-fight career, and uh, you know, working for with you and, and DAZN has been a blast. I mean, you got an incredible insight. Obviously, you know, guy who's been there. And uh, working with Red Owl and DAZN has is, is, is been a lot of fun, and, and you've worked with other promotions as well. How do you like doing the the, the, the commentary? Oh, I love it. Like People are like, how do you like doing that, Steve? I'm like, are you kidding me? I get to sit front row at a boxing match. I get paid. <laughs> I get to dress fly. And people, and I get to speak, because obviously I like to talk about boxing. So, I mean, to work events um, like Lee Baxter, who's one of the best promoters in the country, Three Lions. I mean, I mean, those are those are quality cards, quality fights. Same with Red Owl. Those are those are quality boxing promoters in this province that are building the sport, building fighters. So for me to go to those shows, be able to be a part of that is, I mean, it's it's great for me. I love it. I couldn't ask for anything more. Well, let's talk about some of the fighters we've had a chance to see at, at these shows. Uh, let's uh, first of all, Zolt Durani. Uh, we saw him with an impressive win. Uh, last May at the Red Owl show. Uh, Zolt has some serious pop, does he not? Yeah, some serious pop, some serious reach, and just some serious confidence. I mean, that kid is a, the, the full package. And now that he's got the team behind him with um, Gabrielle of Red Owl, I really feel that he could be, um, along with Cody Crowley, the next world champion out of this province. You mean, Zolt has Lennox behind him. He has Gabe and the Red Owl team behind him. He has Steve Hayden, the strength and conditioning coach. His whole process that he's going through right now reminds me so much of the process that I was going through when U.S. Traffic and James Jardine jumped on board. I mean, Alan Tremblay is kind of like the Gabriel in Zolt's career. So, I mean, a lot of things are very similar to my path that are happening for Zolt right now. Yeah, you talked about Cody Crowley too, another an undefeated welterweight who's fighting for a WBA eliminator, I believe, very soon. And and uh, wow, I mean, Canada's got some pretty serious uh, welterweights out there. We got a lot of talent, and I mean, even as speaking of welterweights, obviously, you know, my my boy Sammy Vargas, another road warrior, who was who was with me side by side training every day, and I mean, for a guy who had seventeen amateur fights, for him to fight the for him to fight the likes of Danny Swift um, to, to drop or mirror Khan, it just goes to show that, I mean, back in our era, I mean, the hard work was put in and I mean, it paid off on fight nights. I mean, these guys today, I feel a lot of these kids today are so worried about making their fucking social media videos that they're not training as hard as they should. And, uh, and the level is kind of dropping a bit. Right, another uh, another weight division uh, where Canada has a good young know, fighter, Lucas Body in the lightweight mm -hmm. division. Uh, uh, Lennox Lewis on hand for that card. It was it was. Uh, what do you what can you say about Lucas? Um, I'm a big fan of Lucas Body. He's a great kid, very very personable kid, and a very powerful kid. But more so than the power in his boxing skill, he's just he's just a very smart kid. When he's in the ring, you can see him thinking all the time, being patient cutting off the ring. I'm a very big fan of Lucas Body, um, another bright star in the making, for sure, in, the, in this province, along with Zolt Durrani, um, Cody Crowley, Evan Gallard, um, the Wilcox brothers. I mean, I, I did a card in Brantford with the Wilcox brothers. I mean, Jesse and Steven are on the cusp, or if not in the top 15 in the world. Um, Spencer, who signed pro, by Pro Bellum, is a 22-year-old fucking stud who has the full package and is destined to be a world champion as well. There's just so many talented kids, and I don't want to forget anybody. There's just so much talent in this province right now that you mean it's the future's bright for boxing in Ontario. I mean, you got Lee Baxter with guys like Lee Reeves and, and the guys that he's promoting and moving. Like, I mean, this big promoter's doing big things. You got Dan Otter. With his Ryan Rizicki doing big things, I mean, mm. there's a lot of a lot of good things right now going on in the boxing world. Joe, it makes me happy. Right. Uh, let's talk a little more about the Wilcox brothers. We had them on the show, uh, and, and uh, that, what an impressive uh, performance that was! Four Wilcox brothers fighting on the same show, same night in Brantford. That's a, that's a first. Uh, how cool is that? Um, it was amazing, and to me. I've known these brothers. I used to spar with Stephen when I was actually fighting a world champion. Their father, Mr. Bob Wilcox, and their mom, Cheryl. 
they've done such an amazing job. I mean, to have f- five brothers who fight, four who fought on that night, one couldn't fight because of a knee injury, and their daughter, Amber, they're just, you meet a lot of different people in this sport of boxing. Um, but these people are just genuinely, like, just, they're good people. They're nice people. They're people that, I mean, mean, that don't really belong in the boxing world because they're almost too nice of people. Um, so to be a part of of that and train and help train Jesse for that fight, um, I'm going to hopefully be doing some work with Spencer moving forward, just a little bit of work. Um, not be his coach, but just help him out and, you know, have a few sessions here and there. Um, that's what makes me love boxing is when I get to do stuff like that and be a part of the Wilcox family and their clan and train Jesse and train Spencer and call the fights at Mark Irwin show. Mark Irwin put on a great event um, in Brantford, Ontario, the Bond of Brothers, a great event to be a part of. And um, yeah, it's just why I love the sport of boxing for the relationships I'm able to have like that with people like the Wilcox families, Mark Irwin and stuff like that. Yeah, amazing. The, the, the Hammer's got to be proud of the, of the Wilcox boys over there. That's for sure. And some other good fighters that just I'm thinking about Joshua Fraser, uh, Melinda Watpool, uh, a, a young woman who's really uh, got to a great start in her pro career. Sadeep Singh, uh, we saw him. him you, you know, anybody else who pops uh, pops into mind? Um, well, Evan Gallardo is. I mean, he's a. Uh... I mean, I'd be a, a, a massive standout on paper right now, but he's in a lighter weight class and he's got a mentality and I've done a little bit of work with him. I mean, he could be, he's in a, he's in a, in a weight class I mean, where it's 108 pounds as a world title. It's 112, 115. There's so many weight classes um, that he could fight in, and compete at with his height of being like five, seven and his reach is like, his reach span is crazy. I mean, he's somebody that could, Guys with 15 and 16 fights get a world title shot at at, that, at those weight classes, and it could be easy for him to, to slip in there and get a world title fight if he's if he's moved properly and gets the right fights. And like you said, Lucas Bahati, my massive fan. Um, so Durani, obviously, he was my babysitter for my kid when I was fighting at Casino Rama. So I'm a massive fan. Of <laughs> uh, Cody Crowley, um, another stud. There's just so much talent. I hope I'm not forgetting any, anybody. Obviously, I've mentioned the Little Cox boys. Um, everyone, I just want to see just just reach the the peak and become world champion. I want everyone to do it. That's trying to do it. Well, I tell you, a lot of folks in Oshawa will be happy if Evan Gillard gets a chance at that world title. I can tell you that. Um, I want to talk about uh, Tank Davis. Uh, what did you think of his most recent fight against Hector Garcia? Uh, would you consider Tank among the, you know, was he, is he in the pound for pound conversation? Um, he's definitely, definitely, he's obviously definitely in the conversation. Um, I just think he needs the Ryan Garcia fight that's going to happen April 15th. I think that really catapult him and put an end to any questions that people have about Tank Davis once he uh, gets through Ryan Garcia, which I think he will get through Ryan Garcia. I think Ryan Garcia is very fast and very good, but I think his chin is questionable. And I think Tank Davis has that power to just turn his lights out. When when, when Ryan Garcia got dropped by uh, Luke Campbell, he didn't get hit with an overly powerful shot and he went down very hard. I just think Tank's going to be too much for Garcia. Ever seen a lightweight with that kind of power? Um, I've never seen him in person, but even, even, when he knocked out Rolly Ramiro, I mean, he just hit so, so hard. It's just so much power. And I think that, I mean, I think Ryan Garcia is a great fighter. You're not getting me wrong. He's very fast and very good. But I think that he makes a lot of careless, reckless mistakes. I mean, when he jumps in, and even when he jumped in or jumped back with his hands back against Luke Campbell, I mean, his hands are down here. And at that level, it's going to be, you mean you can't be making mistakes like that. You can't be coming in or pulling back with your hands down with a guy like Tank Davis because Tank Davis, one shot and the show's over, the night's over. Right. The left hand, the uppercut, he can hit you with a lot of different punches. Anything. And Anything. You. For sure. Well, listen, 
I want anybody. I just want to thank you for being on the show. This has been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, you know, having the Canadian kid, I asked you before we came on how the golf game is. I know with a couple of kids too, and this, that, and the other thing, it's pretty, pretty hard to play golf, but, uh, I'll get you out this summer for sure. All right, Joe, for sure. And we'll be calling some more red owl events. And it's always good to have you have you around, buddy. Thank you for everything, brother. All right. Thanks, Stevie. All right. The Canadian kid, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Molitor will have more sports when we come back. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA, Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year-round. Go to hpibet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today, and your first bet is free. That's hpibet.com. Visit moregolf.ca. You'll find everything a golfer could need, from balls, gloves, clubs, custom fitting opportunities, training gear, valuable accessories, and some great deals. Looking for that perfect gift idea for the golfer in your life? Go to moregolf.ca today. Now my Costa Swiss pick of the week. Last time out, I picked Barzi in the third race in Mohawk. No doubt she would have got the job done, but the race card was scrapped due to lousy weather. Much better conditions the following night for the $30,000 preferred pace. Need to breathe with Travis Cullen driving for trainer Jody Cullen. A wire-to-wire victory, pulling away easily in 152 and 3. Well, this week, let's try this again. We'll take Barzi, the number seven horse this time in the eighth race of Mohawk, and a 378 exactor and triactor box. The Mohawk stake schedule was unveiled. There will be over $15 million in stakes highlighted by the 40th edition of the Pepsi North America Cup on Saturday, June 17th. We'll see you there. For all the racing updates, visit Costa TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. This is the Excellent Sports Adventure. Brought to you by Rycom. Well, a chance to close the gap on the league-leading Boston Bruins. At least had a shot, but couldn't get it done. Austin Matthews returned to the lineup, takes the feed from Michael Bunting, and check out the hands. Roof Daddy, his 21st, that tied the game. Unfortunately, the Bruins scored late to pull out the victory. A big divisional battle for the Oilers facing the Golden Knights. Leon Dreisaitl breaks out, leading a two-on-one, decides to keep, shoots, and scores. Leon, second of the game, 26th overall. Oilers over the Knights, 4-3. Jets home to the Coyotes, who are just god-awful. Some slick passing, Cole Perfetti behind the back from Mark Shifley to Blake Wheeler. The Jets hand the Dogs their ninth straight loss. Winnipeg is tops in the West. Canada put a beat down on Sweden in the gold medal final at the Women's Under-18 World Championships. Caitlin Kramer scored an incredible four games in the champion in the goals and four goals in the championships final to pace the Canadian side to a 10 nothing romp. The 16 year from Waterloo scored a record 10 times in the tournament. 10 Canadian goals in the final was also a record. Well, I guess tanking is obviously not an option. The Raptors finally put a winning streak together. Yes, they did. Mind you, the competition was exactly the toughest. Precious Achua is starting to find his groove after missing 24 games for that ankle injury. Well, Pascal Siakam 
has been looking like an MVP candidate. Another 35-point effort as the refs rung up the Hornets for the third straight win. The streak ended when the Atlanta Hawks dropped by, but then Raps and Knicks at MSG. The Raps finally, they rally late again. Pascal Siakam kicks out to Fred Van Vliet. Freddie V for three of his 33. They forced overtime. Scotty Barnes to Siakam. Spicy P with 20. Barnes had 26. Raps stunned the Knicks 123-121. No tanking for these guys. Well, Bianca Andreescu is ready to climb the ladder back to the top of the tennis world. Apparently, the 22-year-old from Mississauga rolled over world number 25, Marie Buzkova, 6-2-6-4 in round one of the Aussie Open. Leila Annie Fernandez knocked off Elise Cornet. An all-Canadian matchup, six-seeded Felix Oje Alisim got past Vasek Pospisil in four sets, while Denis Shapovalov advanced in four over Serbian Dusan Lajevic. Well, for the first time in decades, a Canadian has topped the podium at a World Cup ski jumping event. Alexander Ludic won gold in Japan to become the first Canadian woman to, to ever reach the top of the World Cup ski jumping podium. The 19-year-old from Calgary won the normal hill competition with 240.3 points after jumps of 98.5 and 95 meters. Well, the Toronto Rock, we're back in the friendly confines, getting the job done, too. First Ontario Centre in Hamilton, where the Rock faced the Halifax Thunderbirds, a feisty affair. Another big night for Tom Schreiber. The veteran sniper scored five times and added a couple assists as the Rock shot down the birds 17-8. to Next home date is February 4th against New York. Two of the top contenders on the PGA Champions Tour we're at El Tigre Golf Course in Nuevo Vallarta, Mexico, for a clinic put on by Renew Medical Center in Nuevo Vallarta. Gary Halberg, former PGA Rookie of the Year, three-time winner on the big tour and 12 victories as a pro. And Esteban Toledo has won four times on the Champions Tour, including a win in Canada. Longtime NCAA coach Kenny Hepler was also there. He had some fun with some of the club members. Terrific day. You know, anytime you get an opportunity to, to listen and learn from some of the best, it's it's exciting. I'm hoping that a lot of our members will come out and, and take part, but uh, it's just an exciting event for El Tigre to be a part of. It is a wellness, uh, longevity, rejuvenation medical center that Steve Anderson has created over the last number of years. And uh, it's, it's tremendous um, what they're doing with stem cells and all kinds of things for the body. Tell me, you put on a nice clinic here today. What are a couple of the most common mistakes that you see in just about all amateur golfers, high handicap? Well, I think, I think uh, they're, they're rigid. They seem to be very rigid when they're, they're standing over the ball. Um, I think they're set up. If you and I stood behind the first tee and we were having a little bet, I probably could tell you 95% of the time before they hit what kind of shot they were going to hit based on their setup. So I don't think they set up correctly. Most, For the most part, amateurs don't. Um, the shoulders can get quite open. I th you see that. Um, yeah, so the lines are all, all over the place. So I would, I would go to fundamentals, get the, get, the, uh, get the setup where it's, you know, you've got good square shoulders, hips, feet and a soft right arm, you know, and that'll allow you to swing the club. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say that. That would be number one, probably. I think they slice the ball. I think they don't manage uh, uh, the game coming down the stretch, and I think they need to know a little bit about, you know, how to, how to finish the line. And I think uh, some of them, they don't, they don't understand it. They get too nervous. And I think if they can take lessons and go we'll talk to some PGA Tour players and get a little bit of ideas, you know, what to take to finish, finish the line, and I think it can help them out. I never won anything. Uh, I lost to Tiger three times. I lost to Faxon. I lost to Nick Price. Uh, 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 I think I learned a lot through the PGA Tour, and he carry on to the Champions Tour. Oh, thanks for the tips, guys. Awesome. Now it's time for our shot of the week. And how about Gary Hallberg from that gnarly rough? God damn it. Four! <laughs> Well, that, here we go back to that. Just drop the club on the ball. Nice and easy. Not a problem. 
But you see that? When I finish that, that shot, see how the club goes this way? And my hands are not even on the club. If I'm holding it, I'll hit one with firm hands, okay? Now watch me not get the hold. I'm gonna really <laughs> squeeze it hard. Today's environmental tip, avoid using bottled water. Yes, the process of manufacturing water bottles contributes to water shortages. It takes more water to produce a plastic water bottle than there is water inside the bottle. Transporting bottled water creates more greenhouse gases. It takes over 1,000 years for plastic water bottles to decompose and the process leaks harmful chemicals into the soil. RICOM, passionate people who turn complicated business problems into simplified technology solutions for public and private sector real estate, properties, portfolios, and enterprise customers. Optimize and future-proof smart buildings from the ground up. The latest in fault locating, base building network design, managed services, cybersecurity, data analytics. Our fault detection will support all smart strategies, define projected outcomes for capital planning, and reduce environmental impact. RICOM, smart protection solutions, at RICOM, we're building a path to a smart and environmentally friendly future. Folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all around great folks. We highly recommend them all. And thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder, the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, you really want to check out our YouTube channel. There are past shows available, weekly sportscasts there, all kinds of cool segments. Like and subscribe. It's absolutely free. We want to thank Steve Molitor, the Canadian kid, for being in the program. It was great to have him on. We want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by... Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and over-deliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit getaldo.com. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did 905-686-5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting tax and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports, top-of-the-line imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com.